And welcome back to Morning Shot. So Ramon and I have been talking about the uh, the expropriation bill, and uh, neither of us are entirely familiar with all of the details. We know that it's pretty bad. Um, and so to join us today, we asked Gabriel Krauss of the Institute of Race Relations to join us and explain to us exactly how bad the bill is. Hello, Gabriel. How's it? Thanks for having me. Gabriel, thank you so much for joining us. You are a friend of the show. You've been here quite a few times. And I think in this particular interview, we want to connect all the different pieces of legislation together to get a sense of what exactly the ANC wants to do and most importantly wants to do about our property. So the expropriation bill, let's go through each bill. There's only three to really speak of and then we can connect all of them all together. So the biggest problem with the expropriation bill is... Gabriel. That it allows for nil compensation. It allows the government to take away your stuff uh, just like that. So expropriation is allowed in just about every civilized country. Uh, you know, the government wants to extend a highway, a khaut, something like a car train, a subway line, an airport, and uh, it needs a bit of land. So it buys it from the owners. Uh, they have to move, it's inconvenient, but at least financially they are kept whole. Uh, what the expropriation bill allows is for the government to take your stuff and give you nothing back. Um, the key provision to look at is section 12.3. And what that says is that it's just an equitable for the government to take away your property without compensation in five circumstances, including but not limited to those five circumstances. So it doesn't even bother to close the list. It says, you know, we could take away your stuff for reasons we haven't even thought of yet, uh, which is really insane. The first reason that it, it says for sure it's prepared to take away your, your property is if you're speculating, if you've bought it at 10 and you want to sell it at 12, uh, then the government can just take it away and give you zero. So that's crazy. Uh, it's crazy in terms of land. It's also crazy if, in terms of any other asset. Uh, and once the principle is established, if it is established, this can quickly be transferred through other legislation to apply to other assets. So the entire stock exchange, uh, with a small exception of, of, you know, sh of A class shares where people get very heavily involved in the board, you know, most B or B class shares really are just speculative. You buy it at 10 to sell it at 15. Um, that's how the JSE works, uh, all up for EWC. If the principle is established, that speculation is, is an improper purpose for assets. Uh, the circumstance that concerns me the most, however, they're all pretty bad, but the one that really concerns me is 12.3C of the expropriation bill. And that says that you can be up for EWC if you have lost control of your land, of your property. It says, even if you have a title deed, notwithstanding your ability to produce that and show it to the courts and the police, uh, if you have abandoned your land by losing control over it, then the government can go ahead and take away your title deed. So just super, I mean, what it sounds like, and uh, I've asked some legal experts and, and, and they can't find a way around it. It sounds like, hey guys, if you're a land invader, go ahead and invade that land. Uh, and the government is not going to defend the property owner by driving out the land invader. The government can step in and say to the property owner, well, you didn't fight them off. Now, did you? You've lost control. So we're going to take away your title deed too. Yeah, which brings us, Byron, I suppose, to the trespass bill. We've made a few videos on this. And uh, there's been quite a few, yeah. a bit of commotion. But essentially, what did we say about the trespass bill, Byron? Yeah, we essentially said that uh, it was very grey and uh, it placed a lot of onus on, on property owners. It also put the power of removal in the hands of SAPs, which we wondered why you do that, considering SAPs never turns up. And the big part that we identified in the bill, which we also were wondering what that's all to do with, was around uh, legitimate interest, so a person couldn't wouldn't technically be deemed to be trespassing if they were on your property for what they called a, a legitimate interest or a, a reason a reason to be there so it was purely subjective so it could have been something like i decided that this piece of land was my historical land and therefore i was there for legitimate reasons and 
according to the act if you just read the act and the way it sounds at the moment you could say well that wouldn't technically be trespass because i've got a legitimate i've got a reasonable legitimate interest to be there so i suppose using the exact same logic then to the expropriation bill the the, the argument then would be if i had decided that this was my land because i don't know i'm black and this is all all african land is black and therefore that's the reason i'm there you could argue then that i've lost control of the land i suppose gabriel so look I'll, I'll push back against that a little bit uh, to steel man the the argument if nothing else um the the legislation requires a reasonable reason uh for 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 going in there and so describing it as a purely subjective test i don't think is quite right there needs to be an objective standard of reasonableness you know a, a reasonable man or a reasonable person some some abstract quantity would have also agreed that this is a, a, a proper way to go about things and on the, because there is an objective test built into that standard of reasonableness uh, you might go and argue in front of a judge that this person said because of blood and soil race politics that they deserve to take my property or that person said because I wasn't using that stretch of the garden uh, as a bit of accommodated land it was you know being it was just lawn uh, they think that that is kind of excess and idle uh, and therefore they deserve to get on there that's their story but it's not reasonable and it's clearly not reasonable according to the kind of standards that operate in all open and transparent democracies, which is one of the requirements of the Constitution. So you can see someone making that argument. And I would suggest that if the judge um, is doing his or her job properly and sticking to the Constitution, uh, then they will find in favor of the owner and find against the trespasser. And they'll say to the trespasser, dude, you're saying that you deserve someone else's stuff because of race or because uh, it's a holiday house and they weren't there at the time. That's not how the law works. That's not a good enough reason. And so you're guilty of trespassing. So I'm pushing back against it by saying there's an argument to be made. But this leads us to the third bit of legislation, if, if you don't mind me going there, which is the Land Courts Bill. And what the Land, courts, the, what the Land Courts Bill says is that this kind of dispute needs to be adjudicated by a process that is completely removed from the rule of law. The rules of evidence are changed so that hearsay evidence uh, gets basically dis a potentially dispositive weight. So someone can say, you know, how do you prove my ancestors were there? Well, I heard some guy say it at the Shabin. I can't find him, but he told me, and, and I'm pretty convinced that he was uh, a, a proper authority. That evidence can be kind of ruled as, as, as fully legitimate. There's a whole bunch of procedural protections that people would, owners would usually have that are taken away. But most importantly, the land courts bill would allow activists uh so-called you know uh, uh, field area experts uh to decide matters of fact over the heads of the judges so the judges get the final say in in strict interpretation of the law but in terms of deciding matters of fact ex so-called field level experts are going to have the final say and if you think about the kind of experts that that you're going to be dealing with it's land activists who make exactly the kinds of arguments, Byron, that you were referring to earlier. Someone de deserves this just because of the color of skin. Someone deserves this because uh, capital itself is is evil and, and we need to dissolve it. We need to nationalize everything. Both the sort of blood and soil fascist kind of arguments and the socialist utopian arguments uh, are the kinds of things that I've encountered uh, every time I've dealt with not all land activists, but, but, a, but a very large chunk of them, and precisely the chunk that's most likely to get into that position of going over the judge's head. So they are going to be deciding the fact of whether it is reasonable or not, whether this person reasonably believed, whether in their subjective sense of things, they had a, a proper way of going about things. That, that is the concern here, is that insofar as I've tried to push against you by saying on a very strict, proper interpretation of the law, that kind of argument's not going to work that I deserved it. But it's not going to be a very strict interpretation of the law because we've got the kangaroo court bill, uh, as, as I think of it, uh, coming in to, to basically brush away the independent courts and replace it with, an, with a body that is designed to maximize uh, a kind of land grab uh, 
fact fact finding uh, ideology. Yeah, so I think a lot of people are watching this and they think to themselves, well, EWC, you know, it happened. Uh, it didn't pass Parliament because mostly because the EFF did not want it. So therefore, EWC is sort of over. But what do you make the no, they, they didn't mean? want they didn't want the one that was being put to Parliament. No, that's true. But that's the one we are. That's the one we're enough. referring this to. Just this just be strict enough. It didn't nap land. Yeah, no, no, and that's the one. Yes, that didn't that EWC to make the as the ANC called it explicit was it what is implicit, right? Like whether the constitution could uh, give powers to the ANC to expropriate land of the compensation. So that didn't pass parliament. So a lot of people had a huge sigh of relief, and they said to themselves, "Phew, okay, it's sort of over for now. Let's carry on with our lives." But once you join all the links between the various pieces of legislation, like the Trespass Act, the Expropriation Bill, the Land Court Act, or Bill, there's a there's a, a golden thread that runs through all of it, and that golden thread is called dilution of property rights. Absolutely. Uh, two things. One is that uh, there's a fourth distinct element worth remembering, which is the Western Cape High Court's ruling uh, a month or so ago on the Bulalani Kolani case. Uh, that was the guy who famously was evicted while naked in uh, the winter lockdown of 2020. And, uh, you know, he's, he said, oh, I was just taking a shower. And the evictor said, look, we've got independent witnesses that will attest to the fact you saw us coming. And so you ran into your shack to get undressed so that people would uh, take an image and make it go viral to try and embarrass us and, and protect yourself from eviction. But you were unlawfully there, and so we had every right to evict you. And the independent investigation exonerated the anti-land invasion unit uh, in the Western Cape, uh, uh, not a unit that uh, uh, the rest of the country enjoys, but in, 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 in any kind of effective way. Here's the point. The latest judgment, the original judgment said, okay, a moratorium on evictions during, during the plague, during the lockdown. The latest judgment said, okay, now that's all over. How do we deal with the following fact? If someone is living there, a dweller, if someone has dwelling status, according to section 26 of the constitution, you can't kick them out without getting a court order. The way the court process is set up, that's going to take you minimum eight months. There's a sort of requirement for alternative accommodation. So you can provide that to speed up the process. That means you have to buy someone a new house or uh, you can wait for the state to provide that, but the state list can, uh, you know, is a long one. That person can sit on your property in the meanwhile for years and years while you're obliged to pay rates and taxes. Now, the Western Cape government recently came out with the figures of 15 billion rands worth, I think it was 15 billion rands worth of government land being invaded in this kind of way. Uh, the private property figures around the country haven't been well tabulated. Um, but uh, anyone who's driven on the N1 from Joburg to Cape Town or the N3 from Joburg to Durban uh, or going up to Nelspreit will have seen uh, various mushrooming illegal settlements uh, around the country and, and will appreciate the widespread nature of this concern. Here's the point. Once someone is living there, you're stuck with this very long process. But when they've just invaded, you can remove them yourselves or you can get a security company to remove them or you can call the police and if you're very lucky the police might come and help you remove them according to the law but that law the window for how long does it take for them to get dweller status was radically closed by the western cape high court in the kalani case what they said is you know metaphorically once the guy's had enough time to take off his pants he's no longer an invader he's now living there he's made himself at home so it's his home uh and in terms of the hard law what it says paragraph 89 of the judgment is that uh, once the if there's a construction once it moved past the stage of just pegs in the ground in other words once there's one sheet of metal that's leaning against a tree or some bricks that have been assembled even if they haven't been laid and plastered just a little pile of bricks on the side uh, then the construction can be considered uh, close enough as to be perfected it's what it's perfected is his dweller status the fact that he's made himself at home He's bedded down. And then you can't simply get rid of him. You have to go through the eight-month court process. And here, the, here you see another connection, which is that insofar as the government standing interpretation of Section 26 of the Constitution is that you must provide alternative accommodation to illegal land invaders. If someone has invaded your land and the government now wants to take, it, take away your title deed under Section 12.3 of the Expropriation Bill, They'll have a legitimate interest in doing so, which is to provide alternative accommodation to the land invaders. 
They can say, look, you guys invaded this land. It's mm. illegal. But if we take away the title deed from this guy, it's now government land. And we now give you permission to stay here. You don't have to wait on the list for three years. And there's no transport costs. We've turned you from an illegal land invader to a legitimate uh, dweller on, on nationalized land at a transport cost of zero. Uh, and so it's efficient and it's a good way to go about things. So if you look at that uh, that high court judgment, uh, I, I think you see a further a further connection there to watering down property rights. And really the effect of it, I think if you want to, you know, the, the too long didn't read version is to is to look at Zimbabwe, where you had land invasions uh, that that were not exactly spontaneous, but that preceded the law. Literally mobs went out and uh, drove out farm workers trying to protect their places of work and business, drove out farm owners and people who lived on, on their in their own uh, you know sunshine factories. And then the law tried to catch up with it. What Ramaphosa always promised is that we wouldn't be like Zimbabwe because we would do it by the book. And this is what it looks like. The expropriation bill, the land courts bill, the unlawful entry premises bill, the counter spoliation precedent set by the Western Cape High Court. It's by the book that the law paves the way for a land grab. Every step of the way, from the first moment you break in, to bedding down, to getting the title deed, to being protected from prosecution afterwards, the law paves the way for land grabs and 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 completely erodes the right of the property owner to to hold on to what's theirs. Uh, if you think it's any consolation that the that the law is going to legitimize theft, uh, just look at Venezuela, which wasn't like Zimbabwe, where, where first the mob led the way and then the government tried to catch up. In Venezuela, it was done by the book too. Uh, and the consequences were so dire that the average Venezuelan has lost 12 kgs weight through a sort of government starvation program. Uh, the currency is hyperinflated to the point where all people's savings have diminished. The average professor and uh, and doctor is monthly wage from the government now can't buy four loaves of bread and two tomatoes um it really is a, a horrific situation where everyone who can flee has fled and everyone who remains is immiserated um that was by the book land grabs and that's the program that the anc is currently set for south africa uh it's uh, it's very important to not be complacent and not think that because the constitutional amendment didn't go through, this can't happen. Unfortunately, that whole implicit, explicit thing that you referred to, Ramon, the constitution very clearly prevents all of this if you just read the letters of the law. But if you read in between the lines in the way that the ANC has tried to do and has convinced, unfortunately, even some players in big business and academia and the media, it's... It's, it's changed in between the lines, in between the lines, according to so many people, it now allows for expropriation without compensation. So even though they didn't change the letter of the law, uh, they might have changed the opinion of what the law allows and doesn't allow in enough uh, people's heads that uh, the Constitution won't save us if we're not prepared to stand up and save ourselves. Interesting. So now that you've painted a doomsday scenario, What's what hope is there for anybody? I think it's very important to note that in December 2021, when the 18th Constitutional Amendment Bill failed, uh, it failed because it only got 204 votes. So there's 400 members of parliament in the National Assembly. So a majority is 200. So they, they got a majority plus four. It's not only the EFF that stayed away for political reasons. It's also ANC MPs, roughly 25, 30 ANC MPs stayed away because they also had a few tiny little parties that joined them in. So you need 201 votes to pass this thing. Well, 200 plus the speaker's special dispensation, but let's say 201. So if you can get rid of five MPs, if you can get five more ANC MPs to stay away or five more MPs from some of those smaller parties to stay away, they don't have to explicitly come out against it. They can just get lost in traffic, get stuck in traffic. They can have a sick day. There's all kinds of ways. Those other ANC MPs didn't advertise the fact that they didn't vote for expropriation without compensation. They quietly um, sort of demurred, as it were. And they did so because of pressure. They did so because it was so obviously a stupid idea that would ruin this country. And because there wasn't a great prospect of, of, of victory, it was convenient for them to stay away. It saves them 
the opportunity. It's like a little insurance policy. If they do one day defect from the ANC, if the ANC does one day collapse, they can come out and say, you know, look, we we were with the ANC, we believed in it, but we didn't go all the way to, to voting for its most stupid ideas. We just need to add five more people to that list. And the way to do that is through pressure. That's the pressure really does affect politicians who are ultimately competing to hold on to their own jobs, to hold on to their, you know, nipple on the teat of the of the government hog of largesse. And uh, there's two ways to direct that pressure, I think, that are that are obvious and important to rehearse, nevertheless. One is by challenging big business. So we've got a letter writing campaign against, well, with the all the major banks in South Africa to say you uh, came out against EWC um, last year, but now Ramaphosa has brought it back to life at the ANC policy conference saying, you know, it's a great idea. Are you willing to come out and refresh your own view, uh, refresh your pressure against it? Um, I think that everyone who is with a bank or with an insurance company uh, should go ahead and write to their manager, write to whoever their sales rep is and say, what are you doing to protect my uh, assets that you, you know, you have a fiduciary duty to protect your clients from this direct and systemic risk? Are you doing anything about it? Uh, the same for the major food retailers, you know, we've written to all of them saying, food security is already a nightmare in this country. Uh, with the war in Ukraine and the recent visit from the Americans, it's like well, half of all anyone could talk about. And it really is a crisis. There's 1.5 million children suffering stunted growth because of malnutrition, climbing to 1.7 by 2025. That is unacceptable. We were already having a food crisis. Um, this is going to make it much worse. What are you guys with all of your brand advertising about social conscience and caring about the little guy? What are you actually doing about it? Woolworths, checkers, pick and pay and so on. Um, we've gotten some responses from them and we've got a meeting already arranged with them uh, with the sort of uh, commercial goods consortium. Uh, but I think the more private consumers apply pressure, the more that then feeds upwards. Uh, the same for property developers uh, and so on. Wherever you're connected to the property market, apply some pressure and let that feed upwards. That's one route. The other route is uh, to sign on to the Institute of Race Relations petition. Uh, we've been running it for two weeks. You've been getting thousands of signups a day. I don't know what the numbers are exactly, but it's it's been doing very well, and we appreciate that. We've got 350,000 signatures against the expropriation provision with our compensation bill last time, and that made it easier for us to apply pressure both domestically and abroad in our interactions with uh, uh, with various uh, dip diplomatic corps and, 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 and foreign civil society organizations, and that in turn turns into pressure. Uh, that that bears down on Pretoria uh, through whatever channel you can use other civil society organizations too. Uh, the thing to do is is not to be complacent. Um, I'll, I'll just wrap this by saying I was once uh, at a sort of uh, off the beat land conference in KZN where uh, uh, a couple of uh, Zimbabwean uh, former farmers um, wept, grown, thick-wristed men wept uh, in front of the crowd saying, if only, if only we didn't watch it all happen step for step, uh, with resignation, with grumbles at the bar, uh, with a sense of, you know, maybe it'll work out, maybe it won't, what do we have to do about it? If only we had stood up and, and, and made our voices heard, uh, maybe we could have made a difference. And even if we would have lost, at least we would have had a sense of honor rather than the disgrace the shame of not having fought against it on top of the injury and the pain of having our livelihoods ripped away from us. I really think it's important to uh, stay up. Uh, I don't want to go down fighting. I want to win this. We intend to win this. We think we can get those five votes gone. We think we can apply enough pressure to do that. Um, uh, and either way, I think it's important for everyone who understands uh, the significance of property rights to themselves and to this country uh, to, to do something about it. So, Gabriel, uh, just two final questions on my part, and uh, it's very rude in an interview to ask two questions in one question, but number one, people might think to themselves, well, the ANC might be out of power come 2024, so it's a little bit too little too late for them to try to do this. Uh, or, or number two, some people might say, it's obviously such a terrible idea. Why are the ANC even pursuing this? Do they want to be seen as the next Hugo Chavez of the world uh so some people might think all we need to do is like talk to the anc and just tell them how stupid this idea is that will solve the problem 
Yeah, you know, unfortunately, there's two ways to hold on to power. Uh, the best way is to give people what they want uh, within the rule of the law and uh, have them delighted to come and congratulate you by voting you in next time. And that's exactly what the ANC did in the Mandela and Becky era. You can see Mbeki, who was much less charismatic than Mandela, uh, got far more votes because the ANC was uh, you're presiding over 5% GDP growth, an increase in 3 million jobs between 2003 and 2009, um, piped water and electricity being rolled out to 12, 15 million people, new houses being built. Uh, you know, it was, uh, uh, they, they, were, they were improving living conditions and they were getting rewarded for it. But since 2008, 2009, uh, GDP per capita in real terms is flat. If we're, we're making less stuff now than we were in 2009. We're less productive. Uh, we have lost uh, one and a half million jobs that still haven't come back since the pandemic. We've got the world's worst unemployment rate. We've got declining standards of living. We've got inflation that's ticking up. Everything is going against the ANC. Murder, the, the, the crime rates, the heavy crime rates are up too. Most South Africans... Uh, say that the country is going in the wrong direction and have said so for the last five years. In fact, according to Ipsos, which does international polls with 40 countries, we have the worst average in the world, the highest average of people who say the country is going in the wrong direction. So, <laughs> you know, the natural thing to assume. If so then why are they pursuing the country, it? So what's the end game? So, so I would say that the end game is to is to hold on to power the other way, which is illegitimately, which is through domination and coercion, fear and uh, loathing. Uh, ultimately, the word is tyranny. Uh, if you can erode property rights, you have the ability to erode all other civil rights, including the rights connected to free speech and uh, the proper administration of elections. Why is that? Well, everyone is up on the chopping block. Uh, it, when you erode property rights, every municipality in this country that's bankrupt has a quote unquote, uh, you know, public interest in trying to improve its books and it might try and do so by expropriating your property without compensation. The holiday house, the thing on the periphery of the peri urban areas, or the business in the heart of it that the government claims it can run better itself uh, with the more social conscience, as happened in Venezuela, once you allow EWC. Once you allow that, that means every business person that is sponsoring the opposition. Every, uh, you know, uh, charismatic person, every brave citizen who stands up and makes a noise, criticizing the ANC, criticizing its EFF ally, uh, criticizing their inability to, to make life better, stands to have their stuff expropriated away from them. If you look at the expropriation lists that were first tabled in 20, leaked in uh, 2018 for, for candidates for EWC, there are about 200 farmers or properties on that list, uh, almost all of them were connected to people who had, in one way or another, embarrassed the government. That's exactly how it works. So if you can intimidate people into complacency, into, uh, into a kind of ostrich mentality where they bury their head in their sand uh, rather than uh, go out and make a public complaint when things go wrong, you have the ability to hold on to uh, a, a highly ignorant part of the electorate and at the same time, you've got continued goodies in the form of land to hand out, uh, not through title deeds, but through uh, use rights uh, to those that most rapidly enforce your political agenda, your ideology. And that's starting with the land invaders. I mean, if you have land invaders being encouraged by the, a by the EFF and then gratified by the ANC, you have the perfect one-two step. The ANC keeps getting votes because they say, look, we're doing it by the book. We're not doing it in a chaotic way. You're afraid of, of uh, insurrectionary stuff. You're afraid of the, the youthful mob. We're keeping it all uh, right and proper. And the EFF keeps turning on the, turning on the fire, turning on the fear, uh, and, and stopping the kind of reasonable, sober-minded conversations that are required in order for people to realize that their lives are getting worse and worse not despite the ANC and the EFF, but because of them. Uh, so I think, you know, we have we have feared for the last few years the zonification of South Africa, where the ruling party increasingly relies on uneducated, very desperate rural voters who who uh, who, who haven't had a chance to, to figure out how it all works. Um, and uh, they get those votes while while quieting down the urban uh the urban more middle class working class uh, and ultimately elite class people uh who who have more to lose 
and we already see that the ANC in, in the latest polls I looked at, the ANC is below, it's literally even below the DA uh, in urban South Africa. The DA is on 37, the ANC on 33, and that's across races. Um, but uh, rural South Africa, uh, while it doesn't have nearly the, ha the land hunger that the ANC is often described, um, it doesn't necessarily have the capacity to connect the dots. It's not plugged into watching your guys show. Um, and so how's one to know unless you have unless you have that kind of opportunity in the absence of uh, that uh, I think I think you have the the real a real step forward to to dominating South Africa by by threatening people implicitly with expropriation without compensation if they don't get behind the party line yeah listen this is all very depressing okay, I'll go we're not a depressing show Byron can you I'll go lift one last question a little bit I've got one last question. That is, um, obviously, South Africa right now. Property markets, uh, it's not that bad. I mean, it's still moving. There's people are buying property. What's your recommendation? Should people invest in property, given everything, or take their money and run? I think that a lot of it comes down to what you consider an investment in property to be. If you think buying, buying a, a house or a flat or a business uh means you pay the money you pay back the bond you take the loan whatever it is and 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 that's that then i think you ooh, i think you're taking a very big risk i think it's it's probably a better idea to try and manage the risk to see part of your investment as requiring you know private security that is that is a realistic requirement in in most of south africa um i think part of your investment needs to be in in the deeper level of security that is the government into reforming the government into getting the the government to protect your property rights rather than attack them because ultimately no private security company can protect you from the police if the police are there to enforce ewc uh so i think if you're if you're if you want to invest in south africa uh do so with your pocketbook and do so with your voice as well get behind some initiative any initiative to 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 stop ewc um i do think that buying time is very important uh 2024 is coming up and for all the gloomy stuff that i've said a lot of south africans are not happy with the anc they're not happy with how things are going and if the coalition parties can stop squabbling between themselves and fist fighting and whatnot um they can offer the, this really can be a, a change election and if not uh, you can buy time to 2029 when i think change is, is pretty much inevitable um in, in one radical direction or another, either for the real good or, the, or for the worse. So in that meantime, if you, if you, you know, if, if, if you invest in the, in the, in the public square, uh, I think you could look back in 20 years at any property that's being bought now as a fantastic investment. You, you know, you're at the bottom of the political apex. You've had the worst policies of the ANC for the last 15 years. Uh, completely arresting development. Uh, so it's a buyer's market. There's no doubt about that. Um, and if you can invest in changing the policies, changing the rules of the game so that they become transparent, meritocratic, and uh, robust under the rule of law, then then I really think South Africa's got nowhere to go but up. Uh, but the thought that you can buy the property and trust other people to go and make the political change, I think is, is naive. Um, and I think uh really for for a bit of experience you should talk to people who were investing in south africa in the late 80s and early 90s when when this country's back was against the wall when talk about civil war was quite earnest when uh, there really clearly needed to be a change but everyone is afraid of whether it could come out the right way uh the businesses that succeeded uh that try to keep stum and, and try to keep totally clear of politics uh exist but they were few and far between usually you had citizens and businesses that were openly vocal about the fact that the country needed a change and it needed the right kind of change uh, to forestall the worst uh, options of an immediate communist takeover and to get rid of the the racist apartheid regime. Um, that that's that's the kind of attitude that I think is is necessary today. Yeah, and thankfully, you know, institutions like the IRR are making those things happen. Because I think a lot of uh, people in business, they're like, you know, we're not political activists. We're just trying to make a buck. You know, we're just trying to make revenue. We're just trying to make the salary bill and all things like that. But there's an added element to being a business person in South Africa is that uh, it's giving you money at the moment. It might not in the future. 
and just going on as business as usual is not the optimal way to protect your interests in this country. You need to become a lot more activist. Basically, like everyone is woke, all the corporations are woke, you just need to become whatever, property loving. Anti woke. <laughs> Anti woke. <whatever. laughs> all right. I would, yeah, I would say pro, pro property the... rights. Property rights are human rights. Yeah. Agreed. Agreed. Gabriel, thank you so, so much. I mean, I think. Mm, sorry, Ryan. Okay. I think it's our old, I think it's our old saying, isn't there? That's, uh, you know, lots of people say, they say, I'm not interested in politics. It doesn't interest me. And as we always say, yeah, but politics are interested in you. So yep. you can mm. uh, ignore it all you want, but it doesn't stop the reality. Like they're still, they're still interested in you and it has a big impact on your life. So. Mm. Yeah. The metaphor, if I can just say a, a metaphor that I find uh, uh, successful, especially in rural South Africa is fire. Uh, there is no farmer in this country that sees a fire on the farm next door and sits on his hands and does nothing. Because, you know, even if the fire is directly targeting your neighbor, the winds can change and that thing can blow over you directly. So you go and help your, your neighbor out mm. to put that fire out. And property rights are just like that. Um, if, 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 <laughs> if, if your neighbor's property can be taken, the winds will change and yours will be on the line too. So stop it before it starts. Yep. The winds of change once again. The famous 1961 speech, still relevant in 2022. Gabriel, thank you so much for your erudite explanation of where we find ourselves today and uh, making sure that we understand that it's not a hopeless situation at all, but don't rely on hope, rely on action, as we've been saying on this channel for since its existence, to be honest. Uh, so below, for everyone watching, there will be the petition for the IRR. Gabriel, if people want to find you, if you are keen to share your details in some ways. Sure. Um, I'd be very happy to them to go to the Daily Friend, uh, where, where I write things. I, um, I don't have <laughs> Facebook or social media. Go to the Daily Friend. You'll, you'll get good stuff there. And uh, yeah, and check out the IRR's website. Perfect. All linked below. Byron, thank you. Sounds good. Gabriel, thank you so much. And to you watching. Thanks very much, Gabriel, for joining us. Yeah. I enjoyed it. Thank and you. to you watching, thank you as well. Have a good one. Cheers, cheers. Take it easy. Bye.